Cool. All right. Um, let's go get ahead and get started, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm Michael Charles Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue our look at the Upaya Sutra that we've been looking at for a while. But the theme for tonight, sort of the topic that I want to talk about is, well, we're kind of going to be discussing Buddhism and animals, like Buddhism's relationship to the animal world. So that's sort of the overarching theme tonight. Um, coming from the sutra, what we're going to be talking about is this kind of classic Buddhist question is, uh, does a horse have Buddha nature, right? You, you might be familiar with this question of, does a dog have Buddha nature? Uh, dog, horse, the question remains the same. Do animals have Buddha nature? <laughs> so we're going to explore that Zen koan, that Zen statement about animals and their Buddha nature. We're going to look at this cool story. But again, mainly what I want to talk about is sort of, you know, Buddhism's relationship to animals. But I have one particular kind of, mm, like one point that I kind of want to try to stick to a little bit. And what that is, is, is that, as you may know, within the world of Buddhism, there is what is normally referred to as the six paths of rebirth, right? So these are the six options for being reborn. And the idea is, is that, and I'm going to start from what is traditionally the bottom, <laughs> you can be reborn in a hell realm, you can be born as a specter or a hungry ghost called a preta, and hungry ghosts sort of abide as specters sort of in this realm, but as ghosts. So that's number two. You can be reborn as an animal. And those three traditionally are what are called the three lower rebirths. But you could also be reborn as a human, the first good birth in that way. You could be reborn as an Asura, a demigod, a titan, a god, but an angry god. Or you could be reborn as a deva a benevolent God, the highest of the rebirth possibilities. Now, of course, within each of those six categories, there's a variety of hell realms. There's a variety of types of hungry ghosts. Of course, there's a variety of animals, a variety of humans, a variety of asuras, and a bunch of different gods and heavenly realms that you could abide in. But what I want to kind of start with tonight is I want to address this idea of the animals being in the lower rebirth. So the story that we're going to read tonight, or the story that I'm going to read for you tonight, is actually going to call that idea into question. It's part of why I wanted to spend a whole night just on this one little part, because something interesting is happening here. But before we get to that, I want to kind of remind you that the Buddha and Buddhism did not invent this hierarchy. The, the hierarchy of hell realms, ghosts, animals, humans, asuras, and devas is part of the kind of general Indian worldview of rebirth, that those are the options in that way. And it has always kind of been an understanding of that system that to be reborn as an animal or just to be an animal is considered unfortunate. Whereas to be born as a human, <clears throat> excuse me, is considered fortunate. Buddhism, the early form of Buddhism, so the Hinayana or in many ways, even the Theravada, which is around today, they preserve that the Hinayana, especially the, the very early Buddhist path, preserved that original idea that the human was above the animal in that way. 
And it's nothing sort of, I want to make this clear too, before I go any further with this, it's not, it's not that an animal is bad. It meaning that it's not that an animal is bad, but what it is, is that in traditional Indian worldview and early Buddhism, if you encounter an animal, you can be basically assured of one of two things. Either that animal in its previous life was in an even worse position and therefore has been reborn as that animal, but as a step up from where it was, or it was a human or higher that did something wrong and then fell down into that realm of being an animal. So my point is, is that to be an animal within the world of Buddhism is not a bad thing exactly, but it is a bad, unfortunate karmic consequence to action in that way. Now, again, if you were below that type of animal and then got reborn as that, so for example, tonight, we're going to be talking about horses. So if you were sort of a, what would be considered a lesser, less complex, less noble animal, and then you did good as a, maybe a squirrel, I, I don't know the exact hierarchy. So please just take this all with a grain of salt. But the idea is, is that if you were a really good squirrel, <laughs> you could be reborn as a horse. And so that was good. That's great. You're making progress. But it was still considered unfortunate to be a horse in the early Buddhist tradition. Now, of course, what makes Buddhism very interesting is that from the Buddhist point of view, like not the traditional Indian point of view, from the Buddhist point of view, you actually don't want to be reborn as an asura or a god. And that's because to, be, re to re be reborn in a heavenly realm as a god is just as problematic as being reborn in a lower realm as a hell dweller, ghost, or an animal. In almost all forms of Buddhism, the human situation is kind of considered the sweet spot, the like the Cinderella zone of rebirth, if you will. And what they talk about is that basically, if you're reborn as a god, oh, and by the way, I would also like to kind of add into this that you can interpret these things differently. But what I mean is, is that if you're reborn as a god, what it means is that you have everything that you want, whatever you desire, you can basically get it. And so from the Buddhist point of view, to be reborn as a god is kind of unfortunate because you will not suffer disappointment. And because of that, you won't have any reason to transcend that heavenly birth. M meaning you won't have any reason to listen to the Buddha yammering on about impermanence and yammering on about suffering, because as far as you're concerned, life is great. So that's a problem up there. And then to be reborn in a lower realm, hell as a ghost or even an animal, it's considered unfortunate because you basically don't have access to the Dharma in that way. And so that's unfortunate. Whereas a human kind of having one foot in pleasurable realms and one foot definitely in suffering realms, we kind of know about it all, or at least we have the potential to know about it all. And therefore we have the potential to make this radical decision, this radical Buddhist decision of backing out of the whole thing and not being reborn again in that way so original buddhism preserved that hierarchy and is still of course kind to animals is of course against violence against animals and all of that 
but it still holds on to a certain negative feeling about the animal realm. But again, tonight, our story is going to turn that on its head a little bit. Um, let's see. Yeah, before we even do that, yeah, I'm going to kind of rearrange things. I want to do, I want to mention something first, because I feel like if I don't mention it now, it won't make, there won't be room for it later. So I just want to like ease us into this conversation about animals and their Buddha nature. Actually, I'm not easing us in. I'm, I'm di we're diving right in. And <laughs> what I, that's, that was my edit here. So I actually, I want to talk about the Zen koan first. I want to kind of dive into that a little bit. Because again, I don't think it'll make sense to do this later. So there's this famous Zen koan. And if you didn't know, these koans, these are these kind of enigmatic, kind of paradoxical question and answers, they, or they're just a question. And they come out of the Chinese, Japanese, Zen Buddhist tradition. These kind of famous things that Zen masters have said, these koans, well, they eventually all get compiled together in various collections of koans. And one of the most famous of the Japanese collections of koans is called the Mumankan, the gateless gate. And in, so like this is my copy of the Mumankan. So in the Mumankan, in the gateless gate, the very first koan, so it's not the first one ever, but it seemingly was the most like important for this collection. So in the very first koan of that collection, a student asks the Zen master, Zhao Zhao, this, this happened in China. He asks the Zen master, does, and let me, let me bring up the actual language. Has a dog Buddha nature or not? And the answer, the, the master answers, Mu. Or in Chinese, it's pronounced Wu. And I'll, I'll share this with you really quickly. Got my whiteboard. So the answer looks like this. That's the character. Again, in Chinese, it's pronounced wu. In Japanese, it's just mu. And the thing about this character is, and this is kind of the answer to the riddle, so to speak, of what did the Zen master mean when this was his answer? So the thing about it is, is that in classical Chinese, which also goes for classical Japanese as well, because they're using traditional Chinese writing system and the general grammar. There's a character which in, in Chinese is this character and it's pronounced bu, bu. And it means no, <laughs> not. And this would be the answer if the Zen master wanted to say, no, <laughs> a dog does not have Buddha nature, bu, or bu shi. And there's a few other grammatical phrases that could have been used to say, no, a dog doesn't have Buddha nature. But that wasn't the answer. The answer was this character, which doesn't mean no. It means without or lacking. In, in, in English, the prefix un, unoriginal, un whatever, unnecessary, un, un, un. Well, effectively, if this koan was being translated fully into English, the Zen master would have answered 
un. And my point is, is that it's grammatically kind of incorrect to just answer with this character in the exact same way that in English, it would make no sense to just say un. <laughs> like, what do you, and, but that's what makes it a koan is that if the Zen master answered un, the American English speaking Zen student would be bewildered by what exactly did the Zen master mean by that? Now the general commentary, and again, this is comments on the Muman Khan. So the general commentary on this koan is not that the Zen master was saying, no, a, Buddha, a dog doesn't have Buddha nature. The answer was about basically emptiness. Like just to, you know, I'm gonna, it's gonna end this early. The answer is emptiness in that way. And so what's important to understand is that what Buddha nature is, is the idea of the emptiness of things, the lacking of inherent nature of things, the lacking of what is called swabhava, right? This self-inherent nature. So if you understand all phenomena, all objects, all things, all everything, if you understand that all phenomena ultimately lacks inherent nature, then it is empty of that inherent nature. And that is a truth, that is a dharma for all phenomena, including dogs, including horses, including everybody, everything. And so, to answer the question, do dogs have Buddha nature? Emptiness. <laughs> Emptiness, dude. And then that's the answer, which is an interesting answer because it doesn't, the answer is not yes. Dogs do have Buddha nature. That's not actually the answer. And that's what makes it, you know, the, the real answer of whoop. It's a proper answer because the, to say yes, from a kind of technical Buddhist point of view is wrong. It, it reifies a lot of things that should not be reified, that should not be, you know, made real in that way, which is to say dogs and Buddha nature. So there's an interesting answer to this, which is this idea of woo, emptiness. But the reason why I wanted to tell you this now, I decided, is this Zen koan about the, the nature of a dog or the Buddha nature of a dog, this is what I mean when I say that in the later forms of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, which includes Zen Buddhism, and Vajrayana and beyond, in those forms of Buddhism, they have a very different attitude towards the animal realm. And what I mean is, is that the attitude towards the animal realm is not one of, it's not an opinion that the animal realm is, is essentially inherently inferior. Because that would imply that that has an inherent nature, an inherent nature of being inferior to the human realm and so on. And so once again, by way of emptiness, there is a grand equalizing of all phenomena via this teaching of all phenomena lacking svabhava. So my point is, is that in the Mahayana tradition, we've, we've made a shift regarding the way that we think of reincarnation, rebirth, and the six paths of rebirth effectively, and again, we're going to read about this, but effectively, they are no longer considered hierarchical. They are just considered different. That to be in a hell realm is different than to be in a heavenly realm. But the idea that one is better than the other, that just speaks of prejudice, 
attachment, delusion. But it would be foolish, though, to not recognize a difference between them. So I hope you can understand that, that there's a that you can recognize a difference between A and B without putting one be above or below the other, right? This is, it's Mother's Day, so I'll use the classic Buddhist example of how a mother or a parent does not confuse one child for the other, <laughs> understands that this child is this child with all of its, who it is, and this child is this child. But a good parent, a good mother, doesn't like this child more than this one. They're equal, but different, understood to be different. So, okay. So lot, lots more to talk about. Yeah, no, please. Great. Uh, I know it's early for questions, but I heard an interview uh, just last week from uh, someone who wrote about, uh, she's a, a Dalit, and she was writing about caste, and it's sort of a manifesto about ending ca the caste system in India. But I remember that you, I remember you teaching sometime a long time ago, and I don't really remember the details of, it, of the way that Buddhism was, you know, or that the Buddha's teachings were upending some of the ideas of caste, but she was tying uh, Buddhism, she was sorry, she was tying the caste system to uh, the the thing we talked about last week, uh, uh, karma being this sort of thing that, you know, uh, that carries from one incarnation to another, and so it's related to these different realms and uh, she, she, it was really interesting. I, I'll, I'll send you the, the, the link. You might be interested to listen to it. But I, I was just curious if you had any um, anything to say about that. I'm sure you do. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it is a complex conversation about the caste system, especially when you roll in the larger worldview that Noam that you were describing, which is sort of about the karmic consequences involved in the caste system and there's kind of a way in which like you can't throw out one without throwing out the whole system and that's in a way what has allowed and that system to be preserved because it's tied into such a metaphysical understanding i will say though as i always like to point out that at the time of the buddha buddhism was considered radical for and it, there's studies on this, by the way, I, I want to share with you, there are more academic studies about how against the caste system really was the Buddha. <laughs> like, th this is a debate about was he like, actually against the caste system? Or was it just that in the world of Buddhism, we didn't care and it does seem that in the early form of Buddhism, the general attitude was that we, we here over here in the forest, we don't care what caste you're from. We don't care if you're male or female. We don't know if you're, we don't care if you're outcast, shudra, you know, Brahmin, all are welcome. And that was radical at the time to create a community in which caste was kind of irrelevant and that all were welcome. That was radical. Was the Buddha trying to up, upend and overturn Indian society? I don't see any signs of that. So, yeah. And we appreciate, I appreciate Buddhism for opening up that path, even if the Buddha didn't go full Gandhi and like challenge the entire, you know, Indian governmental system. So, Vivian, yeah. And then, and then Noe, please. Oh. No, maybe uh, if you, oh, cool. Hi. Hello. Hi, it's Connie. Hi. Oh, hi, Connie. <laughs> hey, Yay. Hey, yes, I know. I'm kind of, yeah, it's so nice to see you and oh. to be kind of like, oh my gosh. 
Um, and of course, I have a question. <laughs> Some Yay. things never change. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so happy. Um, I'm actually blushing. You don't see it, but I'm blushing. Um, <laughs> so fine. I'm so happy. Um, the question that I have, like in the Bodhisattva promise, it is said, um, you know, you 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 come back till all sentient beings are enlightened, right? This is the this is the Bodhisattva promise. So, if I as if I assume that also the animal um, realm, um, I come back for the animal realms because they're all sentient beings, and at the same time, they there is no self to be to come back to you know because it's emptiness um i don't really get these two i can't hold these two together yep mm -hmm. so i'm gonna I'll, i'm gonna happily joyfully um, <laughs> walk walk us through this again because oh. it because it, it, connie it's such a uh important question and i know that a lot of people have this like that conundrum so the way that i would explain that idea so for me it's helpful to keep in mind that like so the example that i like to use is let's for right now connie let's forget about all of this reincarnation business let's just put that on the side for the moment I'm going to get back to the Bodhisattva vow as it pertains to liberating all these sentient beings and all of that. But I just want to deal with this idea of no self versus self. Like that idea really quickly. So what I want you to think about is the Dharma, the teachings are that this concept we have of a self is a fiction, is an idea that is being entertained by this state of consciousness right now. Like right now, you, right now, even me calling you, you is influencing the situation. But there's a mind state right now that could be in a variety of ways. But a default mode of this mind state is to think in terms of self. And when I say self, of course, what I mean is this idea of me. You know, me. Now, of course, I don't mean this, the like this body as it is right now, because when I talk about me, I could be referring to a little baby, you know, me when I was a baby, or I could be referring to me as a young adult, which is a different body, or this me. Notice that I'm calling the baby, the teenager, and this, I'm calling it all me. So what exactly do, what, what am I referring to when I say me? And that's where we could realize that that me is a fabrication of this mind state right now. All right. Now, again, that is a confusion. It's a confusion to think that you're both a baby and a teenager and this body and that it's all you in that way. From the Buddhist point of view, that's moha, a confusion. Now, if you're not fully on board with that idea of no self, I'm going to just have to, you know, I'm going to pause with the, that, but that's the idea of no self, that it's a confusion in that way. Now, the, the, the truth, the Dharma, what constitutes enlightenment is this understanding that there's no self. Ignorance, delusion, non-enlightenment is thinking there is that self. Okay, so that's what constitutes enlightenment, what constitutes ignorance and delusion. Now, right now, 
there is this arising that could be in this state of confusion or not. If I'm, and I am, I am not an enlightened being, so I'm still very much under that spell or that impression of a self, but I do understand the wisdom. I do understand the Dharma in that way. And the idea is, is this. I can remember a week ago. Like I, this, this mind state can remember a week ago. This mind state can remember a year ago. This mind state can remember 10 years ago. This mind state can remember 48 years ago, or maybe not quite 48, right? I have vague memories of infancy in that way. But my point is, is that this mind state right now before you can identify with and as all of those prior configurations of five skandhas. I could identify with all of them, every single iteration, and then that would be what I'm calling me. If I identify with all of those iterations. Now, if I became enlightened in that sense, and I was like, oh my gosh, the Buddha was totally right. There's no self. That was a total fiction. In that state of enlightenment, of understanding that fully, I would still be able to remember last week, a year ago, 10 years ago, and 40 years ago. But I would no longer be clinging to and identifying with those iterations as me. In fact, if I were really smart, I wouldn't even be identifying as this, because this has already changed since I even finished that sentence. And so it, was, it would be much better to not cling and attach and to just flow and just be right here, right now, in sync with the flowing five skandhas. But my point, Connie, is that just because I've cleared up that problem of my mind and I've realized, oh, there's no self, I can still look back and remember all of those prior iterations because karmically speaking, all of those other iterations are what gave rise to this present state. So of course the memories are in there somewhere. But what we're interested in is identifying with them as self or not identifying with them as self. Now, if you're following me on what I just laid out, we can bring back in the whole reincarnation thing. But the point is, is this, from the Buddhist point of view, right here, right now, I can remember a week ago, year ago, 10 years ago, 40 years ago, and it's possible to remember the lifetime before this one, two lifetimes before this one, 10, 20 lifetimes, 100 lifetimes before this one. And the point is, is that I could be confused and deluded and identify with all of those lifetimes as me. And then I would get into this really big delusion of the true me, the real me that's, that's been cruising through space and time. That's called the Atman, the like the real me, which is the real delusion for Buddhism. Not your confusion about a me here now, the confusion about a me that's been cruising through samsara forever and ever and ever. But again, karmically speaking, there were, there were those past iterations of beings that karmically led to this. And I could either be deluded and attach to them as self, or I could be enlightened and understand them as part of the karmic process, but not me. Now, if, you if you're with me on that, and you're okay with me bringing back in reincarnation, and that this karmic situation extends back even further, now we can talk about the bodhisattva vow. So the, 
the whole bodhisattva thing, now that I've kind of laid this out like this, the whole bodhisattva thing is about realizing, oh, everybody's confused about that self. Everybody is attached to the physical body as self, the various iterations of their body over time as self. And if insofar as you've had past life experiences and identify with those, then you're identifying with all of that. I mean, all of us are. And so the Bodhisattva vow is about liberating all of those suffering, deluded mind states that think <laughs> in terms of self. And the vow of that Bodhisattva is to keep liberating until all sentient beings have woken up to that reality in that way. So, Connie, does that sort of put anything together? <laughs> I hope so. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Always a pleasure to, to take that excursion down reincarnation row. Um, <laughs> Noe, did you have a question or a comment? Yes, I, that was, thank you, Michael. That was mm. excellent. Excellent, Thank excellent. You. No, I just wanted to make the reference to the conversation the Buddha had with the Brahmin, you know, in, in a different sutra where he says, well, if, if this if this is a good man, you know, does it matter if he's this class or this caste? That's also a reference to his conversations like, well, if this rich man does evil, what difference does it make if, if he's doing evil? I just wanted, we did a class on that. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder, Noe. Okay, um, so before too much time slips away, let's get to the sutra. So once again, we are in the section. Oh, if you have the book, I'm on page 461. So if you recall, we are in a portion of this Upaya Sutra in which we have been going through what are called traditionally, the nine torments. And what these nine torments are, are these nine unfortunate things that happened to the Buddha during his lifetime. Now, as I've mentioned already, these nine events have been part of the Buddhist tradition for a very long time. They're part of the earliest tradition. And as they appear in the early Buddhist tradition, these nine unfortunate events are used, they are presented as upaya, as teaching devices, except in the early form of Buddhism, they were taught a certain way. And what we've been reading in this book, or lately, is that we've been reading about the nine torments. This is going to be our third torment. We've been reading about these. But this sutra is like reimagining the circumstances under which that event took place. So let me give you the background. So the question is, why did the Buddha and the monks eat horse's wheat for three months in the village where the Brahmin Viranya lived? Yeah, and before I read the, the twist, let me tell you the backstory on this really quickly. So the backstory on this is that there's this really wealthy Brahmin named, uh, he has a lot of he, different names because this story appears in different sources and the different sources will give a slightly different name for this Brahmin. So this sutra has it as Viranya. So we'll stick with Viranya. But this really wealthy Brahmin, Viranya, basically had invited the Buddha to come to his village um, to pay a visit. And this is like how the Buddha rolled. Like this is how what happened in the life of the Buddha. The Buddha would be staying in one place and he would get a message that King so-and-so or the Brahmin so-and-so has invited you over. And so the Buddha and the crew would pack up, 
take the journey over to the whoever and then that person would basically be their um their donor their supporter because remember the buddhist monks are beggars they that's they got to beg for food every day they got to beg for food and so on this particular occasion this brahmin was like sent a letter or a messenger to the buddha saying yeah come on over I'll, I'll put you up, but I'll take care of you. But the story is, is that when the Buddha got to that village, the Brahmin was like having some like rager party and basically ignored the Buddha and was like, I'm too busy to, you know, to have anything to do with him. And so for three months, and I'm not quite sure why they had to hang out for three months, but for three months, the Buddha and his group of monks wound up living in a barn with a bunch of horses, and they had to survive on wheat, on hay, for three months. And this was considered an unfortunate event of the Buddha. It's kind of similar to the one I did a couple of weeks ago where the Buddha went begging and he didn't get any food, but this is sort of a slightly different one. And, and the particular connotation of eating horses uh, wheat it, it'll it'll make sense in a second it has a, a different connotation again than the begging bowl one so why did that happen why did the buddha, why did the brahmin invite the buddha but then ignore him the buddha says from the outset i knew that this Brahmin would certainly give up his original intention of inviting the Buddha and the monks and would offer them neither food nor drink. But I accepted the invitation and went to his place on purpose. Why? I did this for the sake of 500 horses. The 500 horses had already learned the Bodhisattva vehicle and had made offerings to past Buddhas. But because they had associated closely with bad friends and performed evil deeds, they were born as animals. With the 500 horses, there was a large one named Surya Garbha, the sun treasury or sun store, who was actually a great bodhisattva. In his past lives, he was a man. And Bodhisattva Sunstor had already persuaded the 500 horses to generate bodhicitta, to generate the determination for enlightenment. In order to deliver them from samsara, Sunstor Bodhisattva appeared to be born as a horse. Because of the awesome virtue of the large horse, the 500 horses remembered their previous lives and regained their lost aspiration for awakening, or bodhi. Kulaputra, noble one. It was out of pity for the 500 bodhisattvas who were born as horses and to enable them to be liberated from the plane of animals that the Tathagata accepted the invitation given by the Brahmin, though he already knew that he would meet with bad treatment. Kulaputra. At that time, the 500 horses ate half of their wheat and gave the other half to the monks. And the large horse, Sunstor, offered the Buddha, the Tathagata, half of his wheat. For the large horse had already explained the Dharma to the 500 horses in a horse's voice. He also taught them to repent their own misdeeds and to pay homage to the Buddha and the monks, and had said, you too should offer half of your food to the monks. After the horses had repented their misdeeds, the 500 horses engendered pure faith in the Buddha and the Sangha. And three months later, the 500 horses died and were reborn as gods in the Toshita heaven. 
Soon after that, the 500 gods descended from the heaven to the Buddha's dwelling place to make offerings to the Tathagata. Right then, the Tathagata explained the Dharma to them. Having again heard the Dharma, they subdued their minds well. In their future lives, they will first achieve Pratekya Buddhahood, and then without fail, they will attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Enlightenment. In his future lives, the large horse Sun Store will make offerings to countless Buddhas and achieve the 37 aids to awakening. After that, he will become a Buddha named Skillful Subduer Tathagata, Worthy One, Arahat, the Supremely Enlightened One. Okay, so there's more to this that I'm looking forward to getting to, but I want to kind of address something that it might get missed. All right. So I know that in the story that I just read, the horses, it was said that the horses received that rebirth as kind of punishment for associating with bad friends, right? And all of that. And then we even get this idea of them being reborn as gods and all of that. So I, I understand that this story is still operating within the general framework of lower rebirth, higher rebirth and kind of the karma involved in all of that. But there's something really important going on in here though, that again, we might miss it. And it has to do with uh, Sunya Garbha, the sun store, the big horse, right? Now the big horse didn't uh, get reborn as a horse as a bad uh, circumstance. The other horses, yes, but not Sunstore. The Sunstore was a great bodhisattva and actually was trying to do the bodhisattva work, getting reborn as this giant horse. So as, as, as simple as this might seem, as simple as it sounds, this stuff is actually really important. And what I'm getting at is, is this. In the Mahayana tradition, based on like a sutra like this, what we are being told that is really, really important is that you cannot presume that an animal is an animal or like in a lower rebirth. Like, be careful. Be careful who you judge in that way because it may very well be that a great bodhisattva has just appeared to be reborn as a house cat or as a dog or as a this or as a that. So that's actually important because before the Mahayana, before a sutra like this, if it was an animal, no, that's a bad rebirth, period. Again, it might be that the animal got a better rebirth, but being an animal was still considered lower than being a human. This kind of a sutra, the Mahayana tradition, which is based on kind of a slightly different philosophy, it says, you never know. And that all of a sudden changes everything in that way. If, if you, in terms of being a good bodhisattva oneself, again, you can't kind of judge a book by its cover in that way. And therefore you can't judge a soul, pardon the expression, by its skin in that sense. So anything else come up from the first part of the story that I read about the horses? I know there was a few different um, ideas that were in there. Anything pop up for anybody? Cool. So let's move on because the real... Um, you know, this story is not really supposed to be about like the animal human thing exactly. It's it's actually about this this wheat, <laughs> this the Buddha eating this wheat for so long. So yeah, so I'll just pick up where I left off. So the sutra tells us. There is no delicacy in the world which the Tathagata does not enjoy. 
even if the Tathagata ate grass, a piece of wood, a clod of earth, or a broken tile, no dish in the entire billion-fold world universe would be as delicious as that grass, as that piece of wood, as that clod of earth, or that broken tile eaten by the Tathagata. Why? Kulaputra. Because the Tathagata, the Mahaparusha, the great being, has attained the supreme taste among all tastes. Even when the Tathagata eats the coarsest food, it tastes better than any celestial ambrosia. Kulaputra. Therefore, you should know that the, that the Tathagata's food is the best and the most wonderful. All right. So I actually have a lot more to say about that part. There's a few things going on in there, but let's keep going though. And, and then we'll kind of do a debrief. So at that time, Ananda, the Buddha's young cousin, at that time, Ananda felt grief stricken because the Tathagata who belonged to the royal caste and had left the household life to follow the path, Ananda was grief stricken because the Buddha ate horses wheat just like a lowly person. <sighs> I perceived, the Buddha is saying, I perceived what Ananda had on his mind. Thereupon, I gave a grain of wheat to him, and I said, try this grain, try this grain of wheat, and see how it tastes. When Ananda tried it, he found it was marvelous, and said to the Buddha, world honored one, I was born and brought up in a royal family, but I've never before experienced such a good taste. For seven days and seven nights after that, Ananda ate that grain of wheat. Or for seven days and seven nights after that, he ate the grain of wheat. Ananda did not eat or drink anything and was free of hunger and thirst. Therefore, Kulaputra, you should know that this was an upaya of the Tathagata, not a karmic hindrance from some past action. Yeah, so let's let's kind of talk about this. So this, of course, is a beautiful section, in my opinion, like this kind of comment on luxury and like rich people, poor people and all of that. And this idea that for a Buddha, for a Tathagata, they could eat a clod of dirt and it would be better tasting than celestial ambrosia. So there's that, there's that part of this, which is this idea that to a Buddha, even a clot of dirt tastes good. Then there's this really interesting thing, this kind of, um, it, it, it kind of basically reminds me of Never Never Land, like Peter Pan, right? Where they're, I don't know if you know the story of Peter Pan, but they're eating pretend food, like Peter Pan teaches the kids how to eat just pretend food, but how to get full because they're imagining that they're eating all of these wonderful things. And there's kind of a little bit of that going on in here where the Buddha sort of gets Ananda to really taste the wheat and to taste how, how good it is in that way. So there's that. And then there's just this kind of a meta conversation going on about taste that I kind of want to address, right? So, and I, you know, I don't know how, how much I'll get into all of this, but let's start with that idea that to a Buddha, to a Tathagata, even a clod of dirt tastes delicious, right? So, oh, Lily, do you have a question? Nope. Oh, okay. I saw a little hand there. Oh, that's my cursor. <laughs> Apologies for that. 
So regarding this taste of the Buddha. So, you know, one of the things that you should know is that this is actually part of like the Buddhist, uh, like, I guess it's part of Buddhology, the, like the science of Buddhas which is this idea that they have these extraordinary taste buds that basically sort of make normal or even disgusting food taste good. So this is sort of a part of the tradition. It goes all the way back. I kind of want to just talk a little bit about like a, a way to think about that, not what it means, well, all of that, but just a way to possibly interpret that. So for me, like an experience that I have had personally that I think of when I read this story, an experience that I've had personally is sort of the, the vast difference that can happen with the senses in particular taste, but it goes for all of them. And what I'm thinking of, or at least the way that I wanna start this off is, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I have experienced the way in which my state of mind, let's say if I'm in a bad mood or I'm angry or what have you, the way that that state of mind can affect sensory input that there's a way in which when i'm like irritable or cranky things are too loud <laughs> everything's a little too loud and everything needs to quiet down a little bit right so everything's sort of a little harsh in that way and also you know you could imagine this is another you know circumstance that uh, that i've had of like basically going to very nice restaurants where I know that the food is excellent, but because of the company and because of the fighting argument conversation that has happened over dinner, the food is, it doesn't taste good. But I also know that I've been in absolutely jubilant frames of mind in which I have eaten the most cold stale pizza with friends and it was the best stale it was the best pizza i've ever had and so my feeling about this is about that kind of the way that our mentality can affect sensory input in that way and then thinking about the state of a buddha of an enlightened being that doesn't have such mental baggage and mental garbage in that way and basically how it might be not even kind of science fiction but how it might be that as you progress towards enlightenment everything starts tasting good in that way because of your frame of mind now in addition to that while we're speaking about frames of mind there's another aspect to this and it's not about being in a good mood or a bad mood but it's related to that. And what it is, is it's the difference between being present and kind of being, having your mind other places. And so what I'm thinking about are the situations in which, and I have to admit that a lot of these are like after I've been in retreat, so meditation retreat, coming out of retreat and eating a piece of fruit and it just bursting in your mouth and it's like you can feel you can the taste buds are going wild and it's about being present and really really experiencing what you're eating versus sort of having a bunch of stuff on your mind and you're just kind of cramming food in your mouth to satisfy hunger and not even really paying attention to it in that way. Once again, a Buddha is entirely present. That's all they are is 100%. And so I would imagine if you were in that exalted of a frame of mind where you were so present, I would think that a piece of wheat would taste pretty good 
in that way. So those are a couple of ways that I think about that idea of a Buddha or a Tathagata having this extraordinary taste. It's because I have experienced differences in taste based upon mental states. And so since being a Buddha is all about a clear mental state, again, I can understand why maybe that's what happens to one, <laughs> right? So any comments, questions about any of that? Share anything? Hmm. Hey. Noe. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it doesn't have to be an exalted state. It just has to be here. Yeah. Thanks, Noe. Paying attention. And, and that happens at every moment. Realization takes place at every moment. It's constant. But being there, <laughs> that's the hard part. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. And uh, Noe, uh, what Noe just said reminded me, I kind of, there's another aspect. So we could be in a good frame of mind, bad frame of mind. We could be present or sort of checked out. And another thing that really can affect this, an another thing that we have a tendency to do as a kind of default mode, which is a, it's a behavior that a Buddha doesn't have. What it is, is, is it's a, a mentality that compares things. And what I mean is, is it's the idea of like eating that strawberry, but having all these other strawberries in mind, you know, the ones that could be sweeter, the ones that could be this, the ones that could be that. And then you're comparing this one to that one versus experiencing this one for all this one has to offer. And again, I kind of want to point out that a lot of this, it, it, it extends to all the senses, not just eating. And one in particular that comes to my mind is within the visual field, the perception or the judgment of beauty and ugliness. And there's a way in which when we are judging something as being ugly, we're comparing it to other things. Even if you think about a, a, a person, imagine judging a person as being ugly or beautiful or what have you. You really can't do that without comparing them to other faces, other body types, and all of that. And then being like, well, you're not as tall as that person, or you're not as this as that person, and therefore you are ugly or what have you. Versus a mind state that doesn't do that, but actually encounters and experiences each person for who they are entirely. And this is, I would actually then go back to a, a statement I made earlier about Mother's Day and how it is that a parent, a good parent, a good parent doesn't compare their child to their other child and say, well, you're not as smart as your brother. You're not as good looking as your sister. A good parent loves each child fully for who they are without comparison. And in that frame of mind, you are fully experiencing kind of that person without filtering them through the lens of society, culture, your past experiences, your prejudices, and all of that. And then, of course, this could happen with food in that way too, where if Ananda's sitting there going like, this isn't the type of food I used to eat when I was you know, in the palace, which is basically what he's doing. He's comparing what they're eating to what they used to eat. And the Buddha is kind of saying, why don't you forget about all of that and eat this? And then this beautiful section where Ananda's like, wow, I've never tasted anything so good in my life. All right. So. 
And then that brings me to the third aspect of this whole taste thing. And it's this line. Oh, and actually I wanted to clarify this really quickly because it's a term that, that comes up a lot. So the last thing I read, or just about the last thing I read, it was about how the Tathagata, the Mahaparusha, the great being has attained the supreme taste among all tastes. So I want to talk about the supreme taste among all tastes, but I do want to address the term. So in this translation, of course, they use the term great man. And I want you to know that the term that's being translated as a great man is actually the term Maha Parusha. And Parusha, Parusha is, well, Parusha is a very interesting idea. It comes out of kind of the, as far as I know, it's from the Upanishads, not from the Vedas, but more from the kind of slightly more philosophical Indian Upanishads. But they describe this Mahaparusha, the great being. And this great being is, well, normally the description is it's kind of a anthropomorphization of the earth. And so what they talk about is this great being the Mahaparusha, of whom the hairs on their body are the forests. The blood in their veins are the rivers. And so it's about looking at the world as a living organism, as a being. And there's just as much kind of reason to call this Gaia and kind of imagine this as a female figure, there's just as much reason to imagine it that way as to imagine it as a male figure. So that's why I encourage just this idea that a parusha is the great being. Now, what happens is, is that that term, parusha or maha parusha, which has these kind of cosmological uh associations with again looking at the entire planet as an organism it eventually then becomes a kind of an epithet this kind of you know a, a term of an honorific a term of, of of honor that would be applied to anybody who is a great person in that way it's like wow they're so great it's like they're the whole earth in that sense so just want to address that but then what it says about the Mahaparusha, the Tathagata, is that the Buddha has attained the supreme taste among all tastes. And I, yeah, I have a little bit more to read, but I, I want to get into this a little bit. I won't get into it as much as I maybe planned. But within the world of Mahayana Buddhism, there is this interesting idea that is being referenced there. And what it is, is, is that they talk about in Mahayana Buddhism, they talk about something that's called the single flavor, the single taste. And what the single flavor, or what, what I should say first, this single flavor or single taste, it's a very interesting use of language that the Buddhists use. And they're not actually just talking about flavor, taste. They're using flavor or taste to stand for all the sensory organs. And what it is, is, is that when an unenlightened mind like I was just describing, an unenlightened mind compares this flavor to that flavor, this taste to that taste, and then is in the habit, 
has the conditioned behavior of privileging and saying, this tastes better than this. We do it all the time. Even if we're, you know, we're just eating a plate, we'll be, oh, this is a good one. You should try that one. That one's really good. Don't, don't eat that one. That one's bad. So we taste things, we judge them, and then we elevate them or lower them in that way. And we do that based upon their taste or based upon the way they look or based upon the way it sounds or the way it smells or the way it feels, right? So what they talk about is how a Buddha has realized the single flavor. And it's this really interesting way the Buddhists talk, but they describe that, yeah, for an unenlightened person, there's all these different smells and tastes and flavors and this and that. But to the enlightened mind, all phenomena, all dharmas taste the same. And it's a way of talking about their lacking of svabhava, that their lacking of inherent existence, which is to say their emptiness. This is my attempt to now make this dharma talk a full circle dharma talk by bringing back this idea of emptiness. But the idea is, is that to the mind of a Buddha, all dharmas, all phenomena are fabricated, empty, concepts in that way. And insofar as all phenomena are equally word concept idea things, they all have the same flavor. It is a, basically a way of talking about equanimity, the mind state of equanimity that looks and appreciates all dharmas as being of the same nature which is that they don't have a nature. That's like a classic Buddhist description of this idea that the nature of all dharmas is that they do not have a nature. And that puts, again, it puts all dharmas on an equal playing field, on a level equal playing field. And to that mind of equanimity, they all taste the same in that sense. So, that is sort of a uh, what is being referenced by this idea of that the uh, Tathagata has developed the supreme taste among all tastes because he can taste the emptiness of everything in that way. All right. Um, yeah, let's finish up this little section. So at that time, when the horses, when the when Ananda had eaten the wheat and all of that, at that time, some precept keeping shramanas, some some monks and Brahmins, they may accept a person's invitation just as I did. But after learning that they that they are misled and confused, that their misled and confused host will not give them anything, they might refuse to go to that person's house lest they should do this, the Tathagata demonstrated that he would definitely go to a patron's place once he had accepted the invitation. He did so also because he wished to manifest the existence of karmic results. Kulaputra. It should be known that as a rule, even if the Tathagata is offered nothing to eat when he is invited, he will not let the host fall to the miserable planes of existence. So once again, the Buddha did this all out of compassion, ultimately for the Brahmin, who he knew was going to reject him, but he went anyways, and he did it for the benefit of the 500 horses, right? Kulaputra. Of the 500 monks who, together with the Tathagata, ate the horse's wheat during that summer retreat. Oh, they were in retreat. There you have it. That's why they were there for three months. Um, 400 had engendered carnal desire because they had seen many attractive women. If they had eaten fine food during that retreat, they would that it would have only added to their desire. 
But since they only ate the wheat, the coarse, uh, the coarse food, they were not overcome by desire. Three months later, all of those monks were released from their carnal desire and realized our hot ship. Kulaputra, in order to subdue the 400 monks and save the 500 bodhisattvas from the plane of animals, the Tathagata, by the power of his upaya, ate horses' wheat for three months. This was not the Tathagata's uh, past, past karmic retribution, but rather it was his upaya. All right. So anything before I um, kind of end, uh, summarize that little portion? Anything come up? One thing I'd like to address, you have to read these sutras very carefully. Like you really need to pay attention to everything that's going on. So one of the things that I want to make clear is in a sutra like this, when they talk about shramanas, which are these monastics, they are celibate, they are renunciants. And when, you know, this describes Ananda, and these other group, this sutra, a sutra like this, even though it's a Mahayana sutra, it respects the fact that they are celibate monastics. My point is, is that when this talks about this, that, it, oh, it's a, such a good thing that they ate the coarse food so they didn't get overly desireful and therefore they could cut off their carnal desire. I want to make it very clear that this sutra is not necessarily prescribing that for you, for me, whatever that. It's talking about 500 monks who took a vow, who took these vows to remain celibate. Bodhisattvas have not made that vow. So I just want to make that really clear that it is not part of necessarily part of the bodhisattva vow to stay celibate, to, you know, have no, quote, carnal desire in that way. So just because it's referenced here in this story and the fulfillment of the monk's vows, it's because they made those vows and the Buddha helped them fulfill that vow. So I just kind of want to make that clear because you kind of, again, have to pay very close attention to who exactly is doing what in that way. So, yeah. Cool. So I feel like there was one other thing sticking out there. Oh, I did want to mention one more thing. It's a little, um, uh, it's for the, the Dharma nerds. All right, so this is this is like you know for for the sutra heads out there. So this little story, uh, I want to actually I'm, what I'm I'm going back to the the part where Ananda didn't want to eat the wheat, and then the Buddha said, "No, eat this piece of wheat," and he ate it. And then it said, for seven days and seven nights after he ate the grain of wheat, Ananda did not eat or drink anything and was free of all hunger and thirst. So that's actually very interesting for this reason. I haven't mentioned it lately, but a lot of the sutras in this book, the Ratnakutta collection, a lot of these sutras, they have overlap with other sutras. And in particular, I just wanted to share this with you because I know a lot of a lot of Dharma doors people are into this. So if you're familiar with the Vimalakirti Sutra, the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, the advice of the layman Vimalakirti, you know, that sutra, I mention it often. It's a very, um, it's a great sutra. I don't know what else to say. It's like an amazing sutra. But what's so interesting about it is that if you read it, and you like really want to read it, like you want to really understand what it's saying, you need to understand that it, it the Vimalakirti Sutra, is, a, is aware of and is referencing 
the entire Pali canon, so the entire early tradition of suttas, the Vimalakirti Sutra is aware of all of them, but the Vimalakirti Sutra is also aware of all the Mahayana Sutras too. I mean, what I'm getting at is, is that from a literary kind of analysis point of view, the Vimalakirti Sutra is after all the Mahayana Sutras and knows about all of them. And there is one part of the Vimalakirti Sutra that seems to be referencing this. And what it is, you might be aware that later on in the sutra, in the Vimalakirti Sutra, I forget exactly what, which chapter, maybe 10, chapter 10 or 11, but somewhere towards the end, there's this moment. It's a very interesting part of the story. And what it is, is that the, there, basically the, everybody's been hanging out in Vimalakirti's house all morning, like listening to this amazing Dharma discussion, but it's getting close to noon. It's getting close to 12 and they haven't gone begging for food yet. And so one of the monks, Shariputra, who knows that it's getting really close to noon, he thinks, if we don't get out of here soon, we're not gonna be able to go begging for food. And then we're gonna basically have to wait until tomorrow because that's part of the rules that if you don't get the food before noon, sorry, you gotta wait till the next day. Now, Vimalakirti, who reads Shariputra's mind, knowing what he was thinking, conjures up a, like a, uh, well, he conjures up a bodhisattva, a golden bodied bodhisattva. And he says to the bodhisattva, there's a world, like another universe, that direction, millions and millions and millions of miles where there's a Buddha. And he's just finishing up his morning meal. You should go there and ask that Buddha for the leftovers and bring them back here for everybody. And so the golden bodied bodhisattva disappears, zaps over to this other universe, appears before the Buddha, extends Vimalakirti's salutations and asks for the leftover food. Now, this other land, this other Buddha land, it's called the land of gathered fragrances. And what's really special about that other world is that the Buddha there, he doesn't teach the Dharma using his voice. All he does is he takes the Bodhisattva and puts them under a different kind of a tree. And the tree emits a perfume and the perfume smell teaches the bodhisattvas the dharma. And so in that land gathered fragrances where the Buddha is called accumulation of fragrances, the Buddha puts all of this fragrant food in the bodhisattva's bowl. And then he flies back to Vimalakirti's house. And yet another funny, like, it's also something out of like a fairy tale. It's this tiny bowl. And everybody at Vimalakirti's house is looking at that tiny bowl thinking, that's going to feed all of us. But miraculously, everybody eats to their heart's content. And the bowl is still not empty. So that's kind of a little miracle. But what happens is, is that the monks eat this miraculous food and then they start stinking, but in a good way. Like they start exuding this smell of the fragrances from their bodies. And the whole thing is this kind of really interesting discourse on food, on begging, on all of these ideas. But there's a lot of overlap because there's a certain point in that mo in that 
chapter where Ananda asks about the food that we just ate. And basically that he's told that it's going to take seven days to digest this food. Like you're, you're basically, you're going to be stinking in a good way for like seven days. And that's a very interesting parallel with Ananda in this sutra, having eaten the wheat, and then he's good for seven days. So for the sutra heads out there, I wanted to point out a little parallel going on between the two. There's probably a, you know, a Dharma message hidden in between all of those, but <laughs> uh, yeah. And on that note, I think that'll uh, conclude tonight's uh, Dharma talk. I think we've realize that horses do indeed have Buddha nature in that way. So, All right, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Connie, so great to see you again or hear your voice again. So lovely. But everybody, it's so great to see you all. If you don't know, Connie's uh, back from the, old, from the old days. I haven't seen her in Dharmadors for a while. So, But I'm happy to see you all, of course. <laughs>